Okay, so here they're saying choose the correct statement regarding the atomic structure of the hydrogen atom. Now, what do we know about the atomic structure of the hydrogen atom? We know that in the hydrogen atom, we have what? We have one proton and we have one electron. This is the most simple atom that we talk about, right? So this is your proton, which is the nucleus. And around that, we have one electron. Simple as that, this is the entire concept of the atomic structure of hydrogen. Now, we have to check for this in the options. We'll see where do we have the true statements. So, it contains one proton, absolutely true. It contains two electrons, no, it does not. It contains one neutron, no. It only contains a single proton in hydrogen. If they were talking about any isotope of hydrogen, then yes, we could talk about neutrons. But here, no. All are correct? Absolutely not. Option A, it contains one proton is going to be the right answer to this question. Alright, so here they are asking you for the correct structure for the compound. 1,2-diethyl, 1,8-dimethyl, 5-propyl, cyclooctane. Okay, so this is the name. This is the IUPAC name of the compound. And we need to pick, okay, which of A, B, C and D is going to be the right answer to this question. So let's actually draw our own structure and then we'll compare and we'll see which of the options is matching. So first, what is your base chain? So here instead of a base chain, we have a base ring because we are talking about a cyclo compound and we're talking about cyclooctane. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So this is your cyclooctane and you can check all your options have a cyclooctane ring. So that's good. Now you have to place the substituents, right? So we'll start with uh, all the substituents with one, right? Where the locant is one. So if I say this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? You can start one from anywhere. Now you have one ethyl and one methyl on one, which means you have one methyl and one ethyl. Okay, cool. And on two, you have an ethyl. Okay. On eight, you have a methyl. Fine. And on five, you have a propyl. So one, two, and three. This is what you have. Right? Now, Let's check for this with our options. So in our options, what do you have? What does option A have? So since ethyl is the one that is coming first in the nomenclature, you can see that ethyl has to be on adjacent carbons. You can see here, if I say this is one, then on one I have ethyl and on two I don't have ethyl, I have ethyl on three. Assuming that that is one, okay? The way the substituents are arranged, things could be different. So no, this is not the right structure. Then you have Second structure, option B. So here you have ethyl on this. If this is the first carbon, then here two and three. Again, your ethyl has one carbon in between. So which means this is not right again. Then option C, you can see you have one, two. Okay, so ethyl is fine. Okay, the ethyl substituents are fine. And in option D as well, you have ethyl on one and two. So okay, again, your ethyl substituents are fine in option C and D. Then we have to check for 1,8-dimethyl. So 1,8-dimethyl, right? Now here you can see that option C messed up because if I said that this is 1,2-diethyl, then 1,8-dimethyl will be something like this, correct? So here basically we wanted our methyl, but they have made it 1,2-diethyl, 1,2-dimethyl. That was not the question, it was 1,2-diethyl, 1,8-dimethyl, right? So here, if this is uh, 1, 2 diethyl, then this will be 1, 8 dimethyl. So that is good. Option D is doing good. Option C is discarded. So option D is right answer. Let's just check for the propyl substituent on the fifth carbon. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Yes. Okay. So here, what do you have? You can see that here you have a 1, 2 diethyl, 1, 8 dimethyl 5 propyl cyclooctane okay which means option d is going to be the right answer to this question so here the question that you have is saying 0.1 mole of ethane gas and 0.3 mole of oxygen gas are sealed in a flask at 27 degrees celsius and 1 atm pressure okay the flask is heated to a thousand kelvin 
and only the following reaction takes place. Look at the reaction given to you. C2H6 plus 5 by 2O2 gives you 2CO plus 3H2O. Okay. Calculate the partial pressure of the products of the reaction in the reaction mixture. Okay. And these are your options. So see, you have this reaction, correct? You have C2H6 plus 2.5O2 is giving you 2 carbon monoxide plus 3H2O. This is your reaction. Okay. And you are supplied initially. Initially, you are supplied with 0.1 mole of ethane and 0.3 moles of oxygen gas. Right. So stoichiometrically, 0.1 mole of ethane will react with 0.25 moles of oxygen gas. Correct. So I'll write this as 0.25 moles of oxygen gas plus 0.05 moles of oxygen gas, which means that this part is left unreacted. Okay, now coming to the product side, 0.1 mole of ethane will give you 0.2 moles of carbon monoxide and 0.3 moles of water vapor. Okay, so this is done. Initially, initially your reaction mixture was at 27 degrees Celsius and 1 atm pressure. And after a while, right, when your reaction starts, it is at 1000 Kelvin and pressure is not mentioned. So we need to find out the pressure. Okay. And after the reaction occurs, you have, you can see you have some amount of unreacted O2 and you have some products formed. Okay. So from this entire thing, you need to calculate the partial pressure of the products. That is what the question is asking. So let's see, let's write down things that we know. So what is the initial number of moles? It's going to be 0.1 from ethane, 0.3 from oxygen. So this is going to be 0.4. What is your final number of moles? 0.2 from carbon monoxide, 0.3 from water vapor, 0.05 is the unreacted oxygen left. Okay, so you have 0.55 as your number of moles here. Okay, initial pressure given to us as 1 atm, initial temperature given to us as 300 Kelvin or room temperature 27 degrees Celsius. P final is what we have to find out. Init uh, T final is given to us as 1000 Kelvin. So here what we'll do is we'll use the gas law, PV is equal to nRT, where I'll assume volume to be constant and R to be a constant, which means NT by P is going to be equal to a constant, right? So here you have N initial, T initial by P initial is equal to N final, T final by P final, correct? Okay, so now what is N initial? 0.4, T initial is 300 Kelvin. P, uh, P initial is 1 atm, okay, is equal to N final is 0.55, T final is 1000, P final is PF, okay. So now see, let's cancel out a few things. So this and this will get cancelled and you have 0.4 moles versus 0.55 moles. So I'm going to write that as 40 versus 55. So then I can write it as 8 and 11, okay, cool. Now, what else do we have? We can just simplify things. You can write 5 here, 4 here. Okay. So, your P final will come out to be what? 55 by 12 ATN. Okay. I'm not converting it. I'm not changing it. I'm just leaving it like this. I'm not uh, simplifying it basically. Okay. So, this is your final pressure. Now, what do we know? Partial pressure is going to be what? Mole fraction multiplied by total pressure. So here total pressure is your P final. Mole fraction, let's see. Mole fraction is basically number of moles of carbon monoxide plus number of moles of water vapor. That is 0 0.2 plus 0 0.3, which is 0 0.55. Sorry, 0 0.5 divided by total number of moles here is 0 0.55. Multiplied by P final is 55 by 12. So basically you have 50 by 55 into 55 by 12. So let's see this and this will certainly get cancelled. So you have 50 by 12. So basically 48. Okay. Uh, basically see 50 by 12. I'm writing it as 48 plus 2 by 12. Okay. So 48 by 12 is 4 plus 2 by 12 is 1 by 6. So 1 by 6 when you simplify you get 0 0.15, 0 0.16 something like that. So 4 point. 1.5 or 4.16 atm is what I'm getting as my required partial pressure of the product gases in the final reaction mixture. Okay, I got 4.17, sorry, I got 4.15 
And here they've given 4.17, which means option B, completely accept acceptable, is going to be the right answer to this question. So here in this question, they're asking you, for a reversible adiabatic ideal gas expansion, dP by P is equal to what? Right? Your options are gamma into dV upon V. Option B is minus gamma into dV upon V. Option C is gamma by gamma minus 1 into dV upon V. And option D is dV upon V. Okay? So now, what do we know? We know that for an adiabatic process, I can write this uh, formula. I can say that PV, PV to the power of gamma is equal to a constant. Correct? I can say this. Okay, so I have this, I have PV to the power of gamma as a constant. Now what I'll do is I will differentiate both sides. So basically I have D of PV to the power of gamma is equal to D of constant. Now D of constant is what? D of constant is nothing but zero. So this is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so now see, you have D of PV to the power of gamma. So this is of this form, D of XY. So D of XY is nothing but x into what? So you have x into dy plus y into dx. Correct? This is the form. So now let's apply the same here. So here you have p into gamma into v to the power of gamma minus 1. Okay? dv. What did I do? I took p as a constant and I differentiated uh, v to the power of gamma with respect to v. Okay? So this is your x dy. Okay? Then what you have, you have plus y, which is v to the power of gamma. Now, this is a constant. v to the power of gamma into dp. Okay? So, this is dp. Now, this is equal to what? This is equal to 0. Okay? Now, what will we do? We will simply rearrange everything and we will get the answer to this question. So, let's go. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead with it. What do we have? We have, let's see. We have... Um, P gamma V to the power of gamma minus 1 dV is equal to minus V to the power of gamma dP. What did we want? We wanted dP by P, correct? Okay. So now what do you have? You have uh, V to the power of gamma minus 1 divided by minus V to the power of gamma into gamma dV is equal to dP by P. Okay. So now what do you have? Basically, if I take the minus common, if I take the minus common, you have v to the power of gamma minus 1 minus gamma. So, this and this will get cancelled. Correct? So, what do you get? You get dp by p is equal to, you can see, gamma minus gamma into dv upon v. Okay, I've just rearranged things. So, what did I get? I got dp by p is equal to minus gamma into dv upon v. And that is here in option B. Which means option B is going to be the right answer to this question. Alright, so here they're saying the species present in solution when carbon dioxide is dissolved in water are going to be what? Right? So let's take a look at it. You have carbon dioxide which you are dissolving in water as a result of which what you get is your carbonic acid. Now, I said carbonic acid, so which means we have to talk about the dissociation of this carbonic acid in water as well. So, you have H2CO3. This is dissociating to give you H++, your bicarbonate ion. And then your bicarbonate ion is in turn dissociating to give you H++, carbonate ion. Will all of these reactions proceed the same rate? Not necessary, okay? But yes, some amount of all of these ions are going to be present in the solution. And since they didn't ask, you know, majority or concentration, so it's okay to say that all of these ions will be present in solution. So you have carbonate, you have bi bicarbonate, you have carbonic acid, and you have carbon dioxide as well, okay? So we have carbon dioxide, we have carbonic acid, we have bicarbonate ion and then we have carbonate ion which means option a is going to be the right answer to this question 